Okay. But pretty much just ignore it. Okay, ladies, gentlemen, first thing we're gonna do is what they call the opening essay. And it's just kind of like an introduction to this chapter. So let's jump in there. And I just saw Alyssa, no problem. I saw your Wi-Fi issue, no problem at all. Okay, so it says, people cannot survive for long in the air at the world's highest peaks in the Himalaya mountains. So we're talking like Mount Everest, right? So this is way up there. And if you've ever seen anything about Mount Everest, you know that if you're gonna go on an expedition up there, you need oxygen tanks, you need help from locals. It's a big, big deal to get to the top of that mountain. But if you take a look at this, twice a year, flocks of geese, they just fly over. They just migrate over those mountains, no big deal. So how can geese fly where people cannot breathe? It's pretty impressive, right? So obviously geese have to have pretty you know, efficient lungs because there's less oxygen up there. So the only the oxygen that is there, they need to be able to process. Okay, so geese have more efficient lungs than humans. Should we write this down? Yeah, if there's anything blank, you'd want to write that down. Exactly. Um, their hemoglobin has a very high affinity for oxygen. And affinity is just a word that means attraction. So it has a strong attraction for oxygen. Stronger than ours. And hemoglobin that's a protein that carries your oxygen throughout your body, all right? It has iron in there, the iron sticks to the oxygen, and then that travels throughout your body, all right? Um, now, it is so difficult to get to the top of Mount Everest. At the time when I updated this, more than 300 people had died attempting to reach the summit of Mount Everest. So it is a very difficult thing to get up there. Um, even with help from oxygen and you know people that are experts you know helping you up there and whatnot so it's interesting that geese have more effective lungs than we do and it kind of makes sense like birds they fly right we're not doing anything that energy you know um what's the word for it energy requiring you know you know going for a run yeah that takes up a lot of energy but flying i mean they're flapping their wings pretty pretty quickly all right okay so that was just the intro, and now we're gonna get into kind of like how everything works. Okay, so gas exchange in humans involves three things. There's breathing, there's the transport of gases, and exchange with body cells. All right, and we're gonna go over all of these three parts. And the first thing you're gonna to wanna to fill in is this part about respiration. So the process of gas exchange is sometimes called respiration. Respiration, it's the interchange of oxygen, which is what we need, and then the waste product, carbon dioxide. Now we're exchanging these between the organism and its environment. So when we breathe in, we're breathing in air that has nitrogen, it has oxygen, it has some other stuff in there too. And then when we breathe out, we're breathing out nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, we don't breathe, you know, we don't take it all in but we also breathe out carbon dioxide. So where's that oxygen going in the body? What's it used for? Does anybody know what oxygen's used for in the body? Exactly, yeah, cellular respiration's the key, right? But where does that take place? Where does it take place, cellular respiration? Anybody know? Yeah, Pete? The mitochondria, because the mitochondria are the, yeah, the powerhouse of the cell, right? Which we all know because of Ms. Cascades drilled that into our heads, right? Exactly, the powerhouse of the cell, that's perfect. So the reason that we need oxygen is for cellular respiration, right? That happens in mitochondria. Where are mitochondria found in your body? In your cells. In your cells. Where are your cells? Everywhere everywhere and that's why we need this big system because we need a way to get oxygen everywhere efficiently all right so that's how we do this that's why we do this we get oxygen in there and then we also need to get carbon dioxide out because carbon dioxide in too high a concentration is acidic and that can cause some issues with your your body as well okay so the three phases of gas exchange occur in humans and other animals with lungs the first thing we're going to talk about is breathing 
And it's kind of funny because we just do this. We don't even think about it, right? We all just breathe. And except now, except when we're learning this chapter, because you're probably thinking about breathing, yeah. right? So now you can't stop. You're like, oh my gosh, if I just, if I stop thinking about it, I'll, I'll forget to breathe and then I'll just pass out. No, it'll just keep on going. So as you inhale, a large, moist internal surface is exposed to the air entering the lungs, all right? So this internal surface is where gas exchange takes place. So breathing in is just to get oxygen into your lungs. O2 diffuses across the cells lining the lungs and into blood vessels. So we can see that down here. So this is kind of like, this would go up to your mouth. Now there's steps, and we'll get into all those steps, because this is in the lungs right here. This is the alveoli of the lungs. But as it kind of goes out of the lungs, up your throat, out to your mouth, that's kind of the quick version of it. So the mouth, breathing, nose, whatever you want to say, this is to get it in and out of your body. So when oxygen comes in, oxygen is going to go into your blood, and carbon dioxide is going to come out of your blood. And that's what it says right here. At the same time, carbon dioxide diffused out of the blood vessels and into the lungs. What's the, yeah? I have a question. So, I mean, I'm trying to understand about this. So when you see like smoke or something, does all that smoke go into your like blood and stuff? Like, yeah. If you breathe something else in, like, Yeah, exactly. So if you're outside like for like a wildfire happening or if you're literally actively smoking a cigarette or like marijuana or any of that kind of stuff, when you breathe in, all the smoke and stuff that you breathe in goes from your mouth through your throat and all these different things that we'll talk about later. And then it gets to this part of your lungs, this alveoli part. And what it can do is it can diffuse into your bloodstream and then be get carried throughout your body. Yeah, so like nicotine, you know, that, that's how it gets into your body through smoking is through here. And then remember, you're, you're burning little particles of like things, so all that stuff gets in there and it can actually leave residue on there blocking stuff from getting into your blood too. So that's why if you've smoked for a long period of time, your breathing is less effective because there's less spots for the gas exchange to go through. Right? Okay. And even if you cough, you know, you'll cough stuff. That's, that's something different. But um, yeah, so that, does that answer your question? Yes. All right, cool. In here on this page, what's the vocab word from biology that I didn't highlight, but is super important. Blood vessels. Blood vessels is important. Diffusion. Diffusion. And so when I said that this class is connected with biology and anatomy and neuroscience, one of those big topics is diffusion. And does anybody remember the definition of diffusion? Tough one. Yeah, you got it, Dean. What is it? Yes, it is passive transport. Good. Does not require energy, which is great because breathing doesn't require energy. Now, it requires energy for us to move our muscles to get the air in there, but once it gets to here, it's passive. Is it oxygen Yeah, and that's the passive part of it. Yep, exactly. The oxygen just passively goes in here. My question's more. Why? Why does the oxygen not just stay here in the alveoli? Why does it actually go into the blood vessel? And that's the key with diffusion. And let me tell you, if, unless anybody wants to jump in. No? All right. All right. Cool. So if we think about this, when we breathe in, the level, I'm going to change the color real quick. We can think of the amount of oxygen in here is higher. All right. Then in your blood, why would your, your blood have low levels of oxygen? Because you just used it all up in cellular respiration, right? So you used up your oxygen that was in your blood, but what does this blood have a lot of? This blood has a lot of carbon dioxide. So what's happening here is there's a lot of carbon dioxide in here. There's not a lot of carbon dioxide in this part. So what happens is the carbon dioxide goes from an area of higher concentration, which means there's more of it in the blood, to an area of lower concentration. So the CO2 is going to leave the blood because of that, that concentration gradient. 
It just means there's more stuff, there's more CO2 in the blood, and everything wants to even out. So if there's more CO2 in here than in the alveoli, it's gonna go into the alveoli to balance things out. Now the neat thing is, as soon as you breathe out and breathe back in, you're always gonna keep this level low with carbon dioxide. So that's why we always get rid of carbon dioxide. The levels in your lungs are always low. And the opposite's also true with oxygen. There's a lot of oxygen in the air compared with what's in your blood. So oxygen's always gonna go into your blood because the blood's always gonna have a lower level. And that just happens naturally, it's passive as you said, because of the concentration gradient. There's more of it in different spots and that's what causes it to go to the other place. Does that make sense? Yeah, you guys okay at home? All right, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, so diffusion, super important. All right, another super important thing. This might be the figure that you have to draw later on in the chapter. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it is. So we're gonna talk about it in here so that when you draw it, it actually makes sense. All right, before we get into that, let's do B first. All right, so it says transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood. Um, the blue, all right, so we're gonna label some stuff or talk about what the colors mean. Blue is representative of our deoxygenated blood. That means there's more CO2 in it. This would be like blood that has low levels of O2, but high levels of carbon dioxide. So when I do the arrows, what I'm basically saying is there's either a lot of it or a little bit of it. So in this, blue means not a lot of oxygen, a lot of carbon dioxide, all right? And usually this blue blood goes to the lungs because we wanna get oxygen in there, right? And we're gonna show you on the map when it does that. And then red is kind of the opposite. So red means that it has oxygen, or technically we would call it oxygenated blood, or it has oxygen in there. And even more technically, this does have some oxygen in it. It just doesn't have a lot. This has more, all right? And the same thing, the opposite is true with this one as well. Oxygenated blood has some carbon dioxide, but not a lot, so that's why we'll use this arrow here, all right? So when we're comparing, we can see that red means there's oxygen, not a lot of carbon dioxide, and then blue, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, not a lot of oxygen, all right? So that's what the colors are talking about here. All right, let's take a look at this. Here we have tissue cells throughout the body. So this is our little stick person. All right, and here, this is the heart. It's Valentine's Day, right, coming up. And then here are our lungs. All right, which kind of look like that thing. So because Valentine's Day is coming up, we're gonna start in the heart, all right? Anybody know anything about the heart? Like what part of the heart that is? Anybody know that? I'm hoping you don't, because I'm gonna teach it to you this year, so that's great. Awesome, all right, so this is actually a ventricle of the heart, and that's one of the, this actual chamber of the heart does the most work. When it pumps, it pushes blood throughout your whole body. So that one pump needs to get blood not only to your toes, but to, up to your head, arms, all that kind of stuff. And you can kind of see that this side of the heart, that muscle there is bigger than this muscle here. This muscle is a little bit smaller. And that's, that's a design um, because this needs to be stronger. It needs to pump harder. This is also the left side of the lung, even though it's on the right. And the reason for that is when you look down, then it's correct. So then it's left and then right. So everything's kind of drawn. And this works with a lot of the medical stuff. You're looking, you know, when you're doing this kind of labeling, it's like you're using your own body. So if you look down, everything's correct. But if you look at it on a piece of paper, it's going to be the opposite. So this is the left side, this is the right side, which I know is confusing, but we're going to talk about it a ton this year. So that by the time you get to anatomy, you'll know it, no problem. So this is the, um, as we said, the left ventricle. It pumps the blood, which is oxygen rich, that's why it's red. And then it goes to your tissues in your body. And you need to go to these special cells, a special area called the capillaries because they're very thin, blood moves very slow through it. And the reason that they're thin and blood moves slow is so that the oxygen can get out and go into your body cells. And at the same time, CO2 can go in. So this is very, very slow. 
and then the blood will collect and start going back in veins to your heart. And then it's blue because it doesn't have a lot of oxygen, it has a lot of CO2. Right? It gets to the heart, then the heart pumps this ventricle, pumps it up to the lungs. This is what we were just talking about a minute ago. So this is the, the same thing, capillaries in your lungs. So this is where gas exchange takes place in your lungs. CO2 goes out, O2 comes in, goes back to the heart, and then it repeats. And that's the whole circle of blood, all right? So you've heard of the circle of life, Lion King. Here's your circle of blood, all right? How long does this circle go for? About three months, all right? Your one same red blood cell lasts about three months. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. It is related to a heart attack. Um, heartburn is something different, that's digestive, but let's talk heart attack. So your blood needs to go everywhere in your body to feed your cells, right? You need to get oxygen everywhere. The problem with like a heart attack is the heart needs blood too, and as much as all this blood is inside the heart, there's these tiny little arteries on the outside of the heart that feed your heart. Now, if one of those tiny little arteries on the outside gets clogged up by something, then what happens is blood can't get in there. So all of the cells below it, so if like the clog is here, all these cells underneath it would die because they can't get any oxygen. And so the heart attack would be that process of it dying. And then if you recover from the heart attack, this part of your heart is dead. So your heart